Pizza News, first with Brickley. Hello there, welcome to another edition of Newsweek on TVC News. As we start off, it was a change many had wished for long before now. And on the last week of the first month in 2021, new faces replaced the old, ushering the beginning of a new era. That's with regards to Nigeria's security architecture. This week, Major General Liu Irabo, Major General Ai Atahiru, Rear Admiral A.Z. Gambo, the Chief of Naval Staff Air Vice Marshal I.O. Amo, were appointed as new service chiefs to replace the retired officers. First introduced to the National Assembly in December 2008, Drafts of the Petroleum Industry Bill later became a matter of contention due to objections from oil companies. And later on on the show, we'll be talking about a fight that broke out this week at the public hearing organized by the House of Representatives on the PIB, that's the Petroleum Industry Bill, as members of the host communities engaged in fiscal. We'll take a break now and be back shortly. as I bring you news from the epicenter, where it happens and when it happens. Staying on top of every breaking story, minute by minute, right at the hour where the city gets busy and just before it sleeps. We're live from every angle, objective insights and analysis. TVC News, first in breaking news. With breaking news. We cover the big political stories in Nigeria, but people want more than just politics. Business news, sports naturally, but you need news to live by also. Stories about education, health, personal finance, and hey, even lifestyle news. Newspaper reviews, travel news, and much more. Nigeria, it's more than just politics, it's life. Start your day with us every weekday. TVC News Breakfast, first. Fast, balanced, and accurate. TVC News, first with breaking news. We're glad to have you back. It's Newsweek, and we're reviewing top events from the pre uh, this week, this outgoing week. And President Mohamed Buhari finally bowed to several months of widespread demand for the reorganization of the country's security architecture. Later on that day, the president approved the appointment of new military officers to, to superintend the nation's armed forces. The Nigerian army on Thursday took the lead in the handing and taking over ceremonies. And on Friday, the other services followed suit. But I also consider myself lucky. At the Nigerian Air Force headquarters, the outgoing chief of the air staff recounts his journey in the service and highlights the achievement under his leadership. In the Northeast alone, we have been able to generate over 37,000 flying hours. And we have also, uh, having restructured the Air Force, brought in quite a number of personnel into the system.
The new chief comes in amid high expectations. Since the Nigerian Air Force is a continuum and our mission remains the same, the rest assures her that we will work assiduously to consolidate on the already made gains while charting a new course to take the Nigerian Air Force to the next and higher pride of place. The attention soon shifts to the naval headquarters. Although the country has witnessed new security challenges elsewhere, the unsavory state of affairs in the maritime domain depicted earlier has been significantly narrowed. They must be recognized as social problems, and so with the benefit of other complementary remedies, would continue to face decline until obliteration. I am particularly delighted that the leadership of the Nigerian Navy has fallen on me as the next chief of the naval staff. At the defense headquarters, a similar ceremony holds. General Gabriel Ololin Shaki hands over as the 16th chief of defense staff. Today is therefore a great day of joy for me and my family, having had the rare and unique privilege to have been in the military for 48 years. The incoming chief of defense staff, Major General Irabo, was the chief of defense training and operations at the defense headquarters. After now, the service chiefs will be meeting with me in my office for us to address a few issues. That the strides that were made... He comes in with experience in counterinsurgency, having served as a theater commander of Operation Lafayette Dole, as well as a force commander of the multinational joint tax force in the Lake Chad Basin area. C4 is in TVC News, Abuja. Yes, we're glad to have you join us if you've just joined us on Newsweek coming to you live from TVC News. And you've seen our first report. I'll introduce my guest straight away. First with me in the studio is our executive editor, Uzonna Onoye. Welcome to Newsweek. And we have joining us via Skype, I hope he's ready, Ayodele Adio, a public affairs analyst. Yes, welcome, Ayodele. Thank you for having me. Yes, we're glad you could join us. So as we start off uh, straight from the studio, um, it was months, even years of pressure on the presidency to change uh, the military architecture. And now it has come. Is it the so silver bullets required to uh, transform the fortunes of Nigeria's problems security-wise? Well, a lot of people believe that uh, the security situation in Nigeria worsened because the men at the helm of affairs, you know, um, have lost touch. They, they have spent all their youthful years, useful years in service and may not have much to offer any longer. And so the need to have them replaced, uh, that, that's the common understanding. However, some people also believe that the issue with our security system is far deeper than just that, uh, changing the men at the top without addressing the real issues that concern um, exchange or sharing of information or cooperation among the agencies, welfare of the men that are in the field, and all of these issues without addressing them, it may just be like um, living in a painted sepulcher that may not have much within. Uh, but first things first, the service chiefs have been changed, and then coming days will be very crucial for us to watch and observe how they put their foot forward and the level of uh, results they achieve. Yeah. Uh, Ayadele, I'll come to you now, and I'll pick a point from uh, what Uzona has said. He talked about cooperation, which is um, the canal or one of the main criticisms against the outgone uh, service chiefs. Many analysts have talked about how they didn't uh, work in synergy. So with this uh, fresh blood that has been injected, what are your hopes in that regard in terms of cooperation? Um, well, I'm not sure if the major complaint about the former service chiefs was the fact that they did not work so much in synergy, um, because I think that I would argue that most of the um, successful 
onslaught that the military had against the terrorists um, was largely due to a lot of coordination between the, 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 the Nigerian um, armed forces and, and the Air Force. Uh, so there was a lot of cooperation between um, the men on, on, on ground and the guys who were flying in the air. And, and there was a lot of cooperation that brought a lot of success um, in the military efforts against the insurgents. I think where the problem was, was the fact that the, the generals had stayed um, for too long, such that other officers were being retired who were supposed to fill their shoes um, for a number of years. And that, many would argue, created some sort um, you know, of a low morale between the rank and file of the military. Um, that, I would say, was the uh, major problem uh, with the former service chiefs. Um, they were due to retirement, I, I think, in 2016. Um, they were extended till 2017 and again extended up until this very moment. And through all of those extensions, they had to retire other officers who were to have been promoted um, to fill their place. And, you know, there were many reports. Um, you know, there's a special report even by the cable news that said that um, there were grumblings uh, across the rank and file of the military where they felt that it was the turn of setting people to um, get to the helm of the zenith of their career. And they had been denied that by that extension. Um, so I guess that would have been sorted out with the new um, service chiefs. Um, I, would, I would expect that morale is now high. Um, I would expect that... Um, little or no grumblings within the rank and file. And so their job is, is cut out for them um, now to deliver. Um, as much as I'd quickly like to come to Uzona, I'd, I'd like to pick up on, on the uh, points that you've just made. If, if indeed it was fatigue that was the problem because the former service chief stayed for too long, now the change has come. Now that the change has come, what the, the problems remain the same. So what kind of um, support in terms of what they require to work with are you expecting from government such that uh, the reign or tenure of this new service chiefs would be successful? To be very honest with you, I think that we are leaving the military to do too much. Um, the war against insurgency, the war um, you know, against terrorism cannot be won by boots on ground alone. Unfortunately, what we have done in Nigeria is to rest all of our counterinsurgency strategy squarely on the feet of the military. Now, once you do that, um, you lose a lot of opportunities and maneuvers that you can use to outsmart the terrorists or to gain advantage over the terrorists, uh, um, and you leave it squarely on the foot of soldiers. Now, the military men have done the best that they can. Of course, there's always room for improvement. You can always have better equipment. Um, I know that our Tucano fighter jets will be in the country sometime uh, this year, which will improve um, uh, uh, the fight against the insurgents. You can talk about um, better morale. You can talk about better compensation for, for, for the soldiers. You can talk about better equipment. But the reality on ground is, if, for instance, the socioeconomic conditions that is fueling terrorism continue to exist, you're still always going to have ready recruits for the terrorists. If on the second vein again, um, you allow the entire probe machine solely in the hands of the terrorists, you also make recruitment easy for them. So what you need to have is a situation where you have excellent and brilliant social scientists who are studying the behavior of people in those regions, for instance, and pulling out strategies on how to appeal to hearts and minds in that region. You are talking about developing the socioeconomic conditions of that region to make it um, very difficult for people to be easy recruits for terrorists. You are talking about getting uh, moderates on the radio waves in northern Nigeria to ensure that they are not preaching um, hard-line puritanical messages, that their messages are moderate and, and is not pushing extremist um, um, values we think so there's a lot that needs to go into the counterinsurgency war that is just beyond boots on ground and if we continue to make it just about the military i'm afraid that this, the war is going to linger for too long because they can't do this alone they need political leadership um which which has by, by far been lacking so far interesting point there Aya Dele. Uzona, uh, you agree that um the war against insurgency requires a, a lot more than I mean, from his point, non-military approach. 
Absolutely, it does, um, because there's a pool of raw material that the terrorists derive, you know, energy from, and until that pool of raw materials, in this case, human raw material, until that uh, uh, is scarce, the trade or the industry, so to say, of insurgency and terrorism would continue. Um, so there is need for a social intervention process that must be thought out very properly, not one that will be doubled into and jettisoned just as soon as it starts, but one that will be thought out pro properly and sustained. You know, the strategy will be very clear on the target and the goal and, you know, measure, measure that, that will be used to check whether it is succeeding or not. So without that, uh, it, it may not uh, be, be successful. However, it is also very important to be certain about what the military is up to. There is thoughts here and there that perhaps there are some elements within the military structure that are feeding fat from what is going on. And until those people are identified and made to vacate or leave the system so that we will have only people that are committed in fighting and winning the war run the affairs of the insurgents, counter-insurgency program. If not, people will continue to have one step forward, two step backward okay. situation where we will not be able to get to, to, to the um, desired result. Give it to our military. They've done fantastically well. They've been committed in all that they do. They've shown so much commitment. But the fear of having those bad apples that make the entire bunch look messed up is very high. Mm, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The charges before the government flush out the moles and introduce social intervention programs in Nigeria's northeast and in other areas where there is insurgency. You're watching Newsweek. We'll take a break now and be back shortly. Stay with us. This Sunday, a journey to the ancient city of Ibadan to grasp the indigenous cultural attributes of an infant prodigy. A four-year-old boy, popularly referred to as Adigun Lowe Yoruba, has control over 200 Yoruba proverbs, poems, and their translations. Before, I think it is slow now. What he's doing now, I did not expect it. But to the glory of it, it's a gift. His story is full of mystery. Ola Wakon explores the world of this amazing boy, Ola Milikon Adebayo, the encyclopedia of Yoruba proverbs. That's on Sunday specials, where great stories live. Yes, you're still on to Newsweek on TVC News. If you've just joined us, you've missed quite it's a lot. It's the second. We've exhausted, well, we wish we exhausted, you know, uh, all areas with regards to our first topic, and that's uh, the change in the military architecture, which took place just last week. Now we're progressing to our next topic. While it was first introduced to the National Assembly in December 2008, Drafts of the Petroleum Industry Bill became a matter of contention due to objections from oil companies. After the break, we will talk, well, 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 now we're talking about a fight which broke out this week at the public hearing organized by the House of Representatives on the Petroleum Industry Bill. Organized by lawmakers to collect inputs from key actors in the oil and gas industry towards a generally acceptable petroleum industry bill. Presentations came in one after the other with the committee chairman firmly in charge. It's already in our program. Why are people going to our respecting communities? Why are all the people also not presentations there? Powering local Oil companies, 
ministers, relevant government agencies, and the physically challenged took turns bearing their minds on ways to strengthen the bill. But where taxes are deducted from hydrocarbon uh, revenue is the same thing as encroaching on the federation account. So we expect that the bill should not be to the disadvantage of monthly revenue to the federation account. We have come to present one request that you don't change a winning team. Our partnership with Petroleum Equalization Fund have helped this nation tremendously. The schools, the hospitals, and other infrastructure that we built in Niger Delta do not provide for people with disabilities. Therefore, the BOT must contain people with disabilities from the communities. Honorable Chairman. Having exhausted other contributors, the committee turned to representatives of host communities for presentations. But discordant tunes among the Niger Delta members degenerated into a free for all. Authentic and the original natural chairman, which is High Chief Dr. Benjamin Stai Tamarenabi, JP, is the authentic chairman we have. Just like in the Senate, you see that everything was coordinated. And that is what I was asking the honorable members on the table. That why is it that as of Red cannot coordinate themselves? This forced the committee to compel the host communities to simply adopt their memoranda and leave the stage. But this did not go down well with some of the groups. Host communities and civil society organizations from the Niger Delta region were not allowed to speak. And we consider this an ab ab abnormality. And we, we simply state that this is not a public hearing. Vote for the proposed creation of the host community trust fund, independence of the regulators, and mandatory stakeholders consultative forum are some of the highlights of suggestions to the petroleum industry bill as the HADAP committee begins collation of its report. Jokke Adisa, TBC News, Abuja. Yes, you're still on to Newsweek, and uh, we just uh, reviewed that report, and we're going to try to uh, rehash some of the problems that have been presented at that public hearing uh, that turned into a free-for-all when members of host communities um, began fighting in public. First of all, let's look at the problem of revenue that was raised by some of the officials. Uh, Uzana, I'd like to start with you. Um, how can some of these things be addressed? Is it an overhaul of the petroleum industry bill that had been worked on to become the petroleum industry governance bill and represented twice in the year 2020? From what I saw, on Thursday, in that you know, you know, in that uh, scenario that played out at the Nas National Assembly, I am beginning to think that perhaps it is not the bill, it is not the document that is called the law that is the problem of the oil sector. The interest there is overwhelming and quite deep. If you ask me, it's an embarrassment for people from the Niger Delta who should be united and focused to lose the attention they should have and where they should have that attention and begin to fight themselves at the public hearing. What this has done is that it has given whoever that do not have their interest at heart an open check to go ahead and do whatever is pleasing to them. If you ask me, the greed and the personal interests being portrayed by those people that flaunt themselves as leaders of the people is scary. Because as far as I'm concerned, nothing else happened at that sitting apart from manifestation of personal interest over and above the general interest. There is, I'm not accusing anyone there, there will be more than two parties in this case. I'm not accusing anyone in particular, but someone somewhere 
had jettisoned or violated the public trust given to him as a so-called leader of the people to come to Abuja and represent them, to represent himself. And this but, is... But don't forget that one of the leaders said that at the Senate hearing, there was more coordination. Why didn't they coordinate themselves at the House of Representatives? The people that we saw, are they members of the House of Representatives? They are the so-called leaders of the people that left wherever they are coming from and traveled hundreds of kilometers to get to Abuja and fight. It's right. embarrassing. Let's come to our daily. Uh, would you like to talk about some of the issues raised? One of the leaders talked about, uh, you know, urging the House of Representatives not to change a system that was already w working. He was referring to, I believe, the Petroleum Equalization Fund. Another person talked about um, an, uh, another, you know, portion of the bill which addressed revenue as well. What, what, were you, what was your take home from that report? I, I'm not sure uh, the context in which uh, the gentleman was talking about the winning team. I'm not sure what context he was speaking on. Uh, but clearly what the PIB bill seeks to do and what I believe it will achieve and what um, concerns me the most is the commercialization um, of our oil sector, particularly the, the NNPC, um, so that our oil sector becomes as productive and as effective um, as the petrol brass in Brazil or, or the Amanco oil in Saudi Arabia, that is one of the most valuable companies in the world today. As we speak, um, there's a lot of theft going on in the oil industry. Um, there's a lot of short changing. Our refineries are not working. The government is not getting as much revenue as it should get. Uh, we are losing monies every day. The PIB has spent over 11 years in the house. Um, there's a report that says in that same period, we have lost investments of about $108 billion. Uh, um, so except we pass that bill that seeks to privatize that sector to attract foreign investment into the sector, uh, I'm not sure that we're going to make any reasonable progress in terms of revenue generation for the country. Um, and for the host communities, there's an interesting part of the PIB bill that makes provision um, for host communities. It's called the Petroleum Host Community Fund. Um, and the bill proposes a 10% um, uh, petrol um, uh, um, community host funds for, for communities that host uh, some of these oil and gas reserves in the Niger Delta. Uh, the problem, and what I thought will be debated in the House, uh, was to ask very important questions as to um, where is that 10% coming from? Who audits the account? How is that 10% funds going to be disbursed? Um, how would we measure impact in the Niger Delta? Because what we have seen over the years is not a question of whether funds have not been channeled to the Niger Delta, but it's a question of whether these funds have ended in the pockets of, of high-ranking uh, people in the Niger Delta or communities in the Niger Delta. We saw the entire fiasco that happened with the NDDC's um, um, thing in the Senate and in the House of Representatives a couple of months ago, where billions of Naira were unaccounted for. Um, and, and I mean, it's, it, for, as we speak today, nobody's even asking questions again. So we continue to appropriate billions of Naira to the Niger Delta. But it seems to me that it ends up in the pockets of a very few people and the communities continue, continue to, to suffer, suffer in pain. Yes, indeed. Thank you very you much. Know, so Those are the questions that thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We could go on and on talking about this. I believe the consensus here is that the PIB uh, will address the problems of um, oil producing communities in the Niger Delta. But the problem here may be the disposition of leaders of the host communities themselves, of course, would like to give them opportunities to also talk and present their cases as well. This is where we'll drop the anchor on Newsweek. We thank you for your company. We we'll urge you to stay tuned to TVC News as our broadcast of programs continue. Remember that there'll be TVC News at 10. Public Affairs Analyst Ayodele Adu, thank you very much. Our Executive Editor Uzona Onoye, thank you very much for your time on Newsweek. That'll be all from here. Bye for now.